What is the significance of the leather jacket? It's a status symbol. How extensive is this uh, gang activity to, to find these jackets? He said we've been able to clear 40 robberies in the south end of town where jackets were taken. Help yourself. Get to this old school sound with that K-Loop pal. K goes a one, two, three, three to two, one. Can't leave my house without packing my gun. I see niggas dying. Mama's crying. They said, put it back in jail. I said, ugh, you mind. Man, I hope they don't try to strike you out and have them doing big time in Susie's house. More time is coming to my town. Graduated from the pen, no cap and down. Let's call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Now, let me ask you this then. When exactly did the BGF star? Because I've heard several different dates from 1966 all up to 73. When did it actually officially star and who started it? you, Craig, were you in San Quentin during this time? What, 70 to 75? What's going on with the BGF, the Mexican Mafia? Remember, I started in Tracy, right? Uh-huh. And um, I got a bus ride to San Quentin for helping a Latino brother. That's why I got sent to San Quentin. Remember, I always helped the underdog. In Tracy, I, when I got there, I said, it's a new sheriff in town. Because they told me I couldn't hang with the Mexicans. Okay, my little brother that I helped, because we used to sit on the yard, and the and the brothers would always come up to me, hey, Munson, you can't put you on sitting talking with them. You know, that's the racial thing y'all was talking about. We over here. I said, oh, man, fuck that. You know, I was going to be right here, and, you know. And the, come on, man, you can't. Whatever. And now, and all the time, I'm sitting here with this, these little guys, and I, uh, I said, it's a new sheriff in town. No, his name is Craig Munson, motherfucker. Because I, I was a bully there. Not a bully, but I was big. Okay? So I helped the underdog in Tracy, and Tracy. That got me a bus ride to Clinton. When I get to Clinton, since I helped that dog there, his big dogs in Clinton says, we got your back. You understand? Because the grapevine is the motherfucker. The word had got to Clinton before I got there. When I was in, they put us straight in the hole because we left Tracy on a lockdown. So when we get to Quentin, they put us in B section. And the guy, the tear tender, pushing the broom in the hole, he said, who's tow truck? Who's tow truck? That's my, my prison nickname. And I said, that's me. You smoke camels? You smoke cigarettes? I say camels. Okay. You know how to use a stinger? No. I'll bring you. You drink coffee, yeah. You need a pillow. He come back with a pillow, a carton of camel cigarettes, a stinger that you put in the cup, make the water hot, and a cup. What's all this for? What's this shit for? What's what are you doing? For taking care of our little brother. You understand? For taking care of our little brother. I'm like, thank you. So, so, then, so it sounded like to me at that time, when you first hit the prison system, the black and brown didn't have a lot of racial problems. Bullshit. They did. When I first, when I got, when, okay, I just told you, he gave me all that shit. Right. And then two or three days later, they let me out the hole. And when I get out the hole, that's that's a, that's a black. B section. Uh -huh. That's B section. And I got my bedroll, and I got the shit that the brother gave me. And I, when I come out. There was this little brother squatting beside the door, the rotunda door. They opened 
sound like that, Quentin. And when they opened it, I come out, and this brother squatting right there. He said, you Munson? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, I knew you was getting out. They told us you was getting out. Because remember, the convicts run the prison, so they know everything. He said, my name is so-and-so. So OK. I said, we're East Block. I said, over here. Let me walk with you. What you want? <laughs> you know what you want? I don't. He said, um, we're going to make you a general in the BGL. Hmm. He said, no, you ain't. <laughs> He said, yeah, we, uh, we're going to take care of you. I said, I'm already taking care of you. So I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't, I come from the streets from a game, you know. And I, and I, when I walked into San Quentin, I had 21-inch arms. I was already a, a leader. I don't want to be following nobody, okay? The brother said, you can't walk this yard by yourself. I said, okay, all right. You see, I don't want to be no affiliation. Because all I did was eat and train. I eat and train, eat and train, and recruit. I had Bad Bob from Seaside. That was my workout partner. He was BGF. Uh, big youngster, Larry Armstead, he just died maybe a year ago. Terry Bradshaw. Bradshaw could slang some mind, had big back off, talk a lot of shit, though. Uh, he was from the US organization. But we train and we train and we train. That kept us, whenever they had shit in the pen, lockdown shit, a racial overtone, leave my car alone. Yo, we're going to be locked down, but leave my car alone. We don't want no part of your shit. Uh, but when I went to uh, Quentin, that was in 1970, the last of 73, first of 74 is when I went to Quentin. In 1974, uh, in the month of December, uh, there were a lot of tension between uh, blacks and uh, the southern Mexicans, which primarily was was, was any. Uh, a brother had gotten out of uh, the hole, and uh, he had a uh, spit on a dude in a cell. And consequently, when he got out, he got hit. Uh, they sent word from 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 the hole, and uh, and he got stabbed. And consequently, from that, tension grew. And then uh, a week or so later, after a couple of lockdowns here and there, three blacks was killed in one day in San Quentin. That was about, I think it was de sometime in December of 1974. Uh, Quentin basically stayed on lockdown uh, almost uh, six, seven months. And uh, San Quentin basically was like, a murder uh, for hire type of uh, atmosphere. There was a lot of stabbings, a lot of lockdowns. You know, I had never been locked down so much. You know, I was there approximately a year, and I don't think uh, uh, I hit the line and was out in population no more than three months because it was constant lockdowns. It was a lot, a lot of activity going on in San Quentin at that particular time in 1974, 70, uh, first part of 75. Uh, the politics at that particular time was uh, pretty uh, on edge around San Quentin. At that particular time, Munson's was there. When I got to San Quentin, they were already there. San Quentin in 73, 74. There were, there were basically no Crips there. Uh, Munson, they were young. You know, I was the youngest person in San Quentin in 1973. There were no Crips in San Quentin in 1973. I was the only Crip. Now, I had friends that I knew from the streets, older cats that was there, and uh, they took me under their name, Wayne, Sidney Birdsong, Felix Fox, uh, Big John. You know, these brothers that took me under their wing and showed me the ropes. No, I went to San Quentin in 1970. I got, we got busted March 1972, April 1973. I was on my way to the prison, on my way to prison. I, my first stop was uh, after we, she know, the reception center was San Quentin. I stayed in San Quentin from 73 to 75. And from 75 to 78, I was in Tracy. And from 78 to 83, I went to CMC East for a psych evaluation. And back in those days, if you had a murder, you had to go get a psych evaluation. The only place they had them at was CMC East. 
you know, the program. So I had to go through that. I did five years there, and in 1983, November the 15th, I was released. Yes, I got stabbed twice in the chest area and under the arms. And at one time, I only thought he stabbed me here because I thought I put my arm up to block it. And I just thought I was stabbed here. And then when they somebody heard somebody say, oh, the man on the gun reel, they, he dropped his knife and he ran. You know, I just backed up because my cell is right there. I backed up against my cell. And I'm like, damn, I put my hand up. I said, damn, this boy didn't stab me. Now I got to go to this infirmary. They're going to probably want to put me in the hole. And by this time, it's another brother got up to, on me. He said, uh, Baycott, you all right? I said, yeah, man, a white boy just stabbed me in the arm. And that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in the hospital. The doctor told me that when the doctor come in and see me, he said, if my heart hadn't have jumped, I wouldn't be here to talk to him right now. He was showing me the x-rays where the, where the knife wound went in. And he said, during the activities, my heart jumped and the, and the knife missed it. May 6, 1975, you're the only brother 16 in the penitentiary system. Yes, yes, indeed. The first? Yes. And only? Yes. And at that time, I was a, I became a very bitter individual. I, I, I tell people, at that point in time, my life changed. So who did you align with? Just other Crips or you I aligned with anybody who was willing to align with me. So I aligned with Bloods, Crip, BGF, Vanguard. Anybody that seemed like the way I seen them, we can align with one another. You know, but if you didn't see like the way I seen it, hey, you know, you, did, you, you were worthless. I, I could see you were in the way. You know, because at that point in time, I had become very bitter, and the old people knew you got this youngster, you, you got this youngster, that, well, you have a, this is me, and I'm mad at the world. You know, so something going on, hey, I'm, I'm willing to participate in it. Because I, at that point in time, so I'm, I was saying, in my mind, so I'm becoming a murderer. You said I, murder, you said I am. I'm going to become that murderer. You know, because you found me get to him, but I hadn't killed him one, so my mind, I'm going to become that murderer then. How long did it take for you to start thinking different? 32 years. Were you ever approached by the BGF and prison gangs to join their ranks? Oh, all the time. All the time. And what was your response? I couldn't serve two. You know, it's like Sasha. I think I couldn't serve two guys. Run that play back about you being stabbed. Okay, all. Uh, I wouldn't get up under the BGF umbrella, right? And if something went and done, and they needed my corporation to do it because I was on the tier. And I wasn't with it. So I was serving food one night, and this coward, he called my name. Had he not called my name, he could have killed me. He called my name and tried to, this is before they put the weights, the screens up on the doors. And he, and he speared me. And I just started looking at the and I caught it on my arm, right? And I grabbed a knife. Now I got the knife, but he's inside that. He's standing in the back of the cell. In back of the cell, woofing. You know? I'm like, wow, dude, just that. And we go to the yard again. You could have got out in the yard, you know? You could have got out in the yard, you know? So I took the knife, hit the knife, you know, wrapped my arm up. And so by the time I, uh, I go back down to the gym, I'm serving the people that serve the food again. The police, what's happening, man? What's the problem? Why are you taking so long? My well, aunt's having to take somebody to use the bathroom. And he see the blood on the food cart. What was that? And he stood down. He said, what happened? Well, I sit and cut myself on the food cart. He said, no, you didn't. Because the cut was a clean cut. You know, uh, at that time, uh, most of them was beginning to go to YTS or to Tracy. I started banging. I, see, I went. I started going to jail before any of my little homies of my age. And I used to fight Crips and Bloods before they were Bloods, Grims. And, so I just got tired. I was in, uh, I think I was in Y, was I in Y? I was in Tracy, no, I was in Y, in YTS. And I started hanging with Cat and and, and Big Aunt Malone. And that's how I started being. That's how I started. So, but it wasn't no, I didn't have no set. I was just, you know, I just got tired of fighting everybody. So I just chose. So, so you hit prison in 76 is the payback. Yeah. 76, 77, yeah. How old were you when you first hit prison? Uh, about 17, I think. 17, 18, 17, 18. Were there any other Long Beach oh, yeah. paybacks in there with you? Or you were the, the, the so No, no, I wasn't. No, I had home. Chico went to prison before I did. And a couple of other people that was there before I was there. You know? Was it Tracy, the first one you got? Yeah, Tracy. Yeah. Who so was there with you? You remember? It's just the Crips at all. Crips. Bad Habit Rabbit, Eddie Hate Gone, Cowboy, 
uh, uh, all the Baycock. Uh, you know, I was in there with all of them. I mean, you know, I just met Raymond Washington uh -huh. by, by a few months, I think it was. It may have been longer than that, but all the original, most of the original Chris was there when I got there. That little big band, not little band, big band from Hoover, Sugar Bear from Hoover, you know, who's that? Um, I think Sugar Bear just recently got out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How's I, he I, doing? He's doing great. Last time I seen him. Good. Bad happy rabbit child. There's a few people out. It's good. Oh, Charlotte did not. I just gave him five years. I gave him five years. 73, 78. Oh, he went early. Yeah. yeah. So any run-ins with the BGF? Nah, no. they weren't. They weren't that deep. We were in Solidad. When I hit Solidad, we ran. The first person I ran to was Michael Marks, Marcellus, we had Lightbulb, uh, uh, Batman. Man. Uh, we had a. Like, you know, you said like, it was it was about seven of us from Compton. So you know it was no problem. A lot of them who up there were BGF were from Compton. Big Curly, he was uh, Donald Captain or whatever up there. So yes, we ain't have no problem with DJ up there. Can I at least ask you what do Suma mean? Warrior. I started my my, my started my prison sentence career from from Chino to Solid Dead. You know, mm -hmm. but in Solid Dead, you know, I started you know my my, my mission there in '77, and I arrived to Solid Dead in October. And so it wasn't many of us there. It was like probably 10, 11 of us. So you guys had to come together. Yes, well, I mean, you know, when we came together because we knew each other from juvenile halls, YAs, and all this here, you know, we all grew up together. So, yes, we knew each other, and so we looked it out for each other the same as we did when we was in YA, you know, but it wasn't on the game banging tip now. We on a whole nother level, dealing with grown men, you know, and we just, you know, youngsters, you know, coming into the system. But like I say, you know, I mean, you know, didn't nobody know about the crippling stuff, so, you know, our crippling was, you know, hey, man, you know, we was going to do what we wanted to do. You know, didn't know, could nobody tell us anything. So, from the county jail, you know, and up into prison until I got to solid dead, you know, it was about, you know, if I seen something, I'd take it and wanted it, you know, and dealt with it. And then we wanted to get out, we can fight, you know, and get out or whatever, man, you know, going to sell, you know, want to take all and all that there, you know. The dudes and stuff was telling me, man, y'all can't be doing that, man, you know. Like I say, before I left the county, man, I made a path with myself, man. I was going to be a crip or nothing. You know, now, you know, all the other stuff, but, you know, people may say on negative things. You know, I still always remained at a crip. Okay. I loved it all, crips. I went to the pen two different times. First time was in the 70s. I came home from the pen in 1980 from doing a nickel from Solid Dad. It was like 76. It was me and uh, Michael Stone. Was that Michael Stone? Michael Stone, Kitty Welch, Ant Man. It was a lot of us there. Mad Dog, that's the other Mad Dog from uh, from the East Side, and his little brother was Moto, cause he and I were in so in so solid there together. But uh, back in the seventies, the politics at Solid dad. There were politics, but it wasn't as bad because there were Crips there and there were Bloods there because I knew Big Pumpkin from the Grams, OG Thick Dude, and uh, Doty from the Grams, and uh, Cool Breeze. I think his name was Tall, Dark Brother. Cool Breeze. I, these were some Grams there, the original Grams. Yeah. And um, we didn't have no stabbing contests, no funk. Not that many to overrun the place. Yeah. But it was a, a lot of us there. And we had our certain conflicts with uh, the Jama because they didn't want us to function as a gang there. How you gonna tell some street soldiers what they can do? Yeah. Yeah. To me, I thought that was crazy. Man. It was crazy. What they should have been trying to do was school us, you know, ingratiate us, you know. And so when it came time for so war, they had some more soldiers, some more help. 
because they were in opposition to AB, you know, you know, everybody else, but they didn't go about it right. They immediately, when we came in there, they made us their enemy. Yeah. So we had no choice but to arm ourselves and fight back. And they were shocked. They said, these dudes made because <laughs> everybody is not a chump. Man. Killing, violence is afforded to every man. Yeah. It's who applies it the quickest and the best. Mm -hmm. And that's it. To my knowledge, a 1970. What, 72, 73, 74 is when they begin to spring into Tracy, Soledad, San Quentin, and eventually Folsom. I was in Folsom in the 80s, and they had took over Folsom. But I was in Folsom way before the 80s, and there was no Crips in there. Right. None at all. Right. Tracy was a whole different flow of things that was going on there. And I can't speak on what went on in Tracy because I wasn't there. The politics wasn't as bad as the policies were at so Tracy. Tracy, the politics were thick because it because they had a cadre called the Vanguard. And some Crips, some Damood had joined the Vanguard. The Vanguard had its purpose to be the Vanguard of certain gang, you know. Yeah, they go to protect No, just want to be known at that time as just being Crips or Damos. And they were in direct opposition, in my opinion, with the BGF. The BGF didn't like that at all. The faults lay squarely on the shoulders of the BGF, who failed to evaluate and analyze their previous attempts to adequately politicize ex-gang members before placing them in positions of power. In the mid-1970s, after the Crips and Bloods grew in, grew in large numbers in prisons, particularly at Tracy, the spirit of the civil rights and black liberation movement was still very much prevalent in the cities as well as inside prisons. So it, was, it wasn't by coincidence that many of these young men, after being sentenced to prison and having seen the light, decided to drop out of the street gangs to join progressive organizations and groups in the effort to change their lives and do something positive for themselves and their communities. The idea, the idea of creating and separating entity to facilitate educating and training younger brothers to become revolutionaries without being connected to the BGF came from the leadership of the BGF. They brought together those who came from the Crips, Bloods, and non-affiliated brothers and worked with them to create the Vanguard VG organization. The idea of creating the Vanguard as a recruiting stable for BGF was very progressive at that time inside prison. The overall concept was derived from the basic tenets of revolutionary black nationalism, articulating the need to create youth programs in the African communities that can be utilized to grow and cultivate future revolutionaries. With the objective in mind, the BGF intentions were to develop working cadres within the structures of the vanguard organization and observe the prospects as they received hands-on experience dealing with organization building tactical decisions in their in the political and military arenas leadership qualities and their overall growth and development as soldiers committed to the cause the failures in this scheme was the basic teaching and training before inserting those young men into positions of power as street gang members they terrorize and abuse the people practices that are anti-ethical to being revolutionary and servants of the people that gap was not properly breached by the leaders who perhaps thought that the physical aspects of the movement were enough to carry the young brothers to the next phase of their development. I was a vanguard. You were? Yes, I was. You know money, Mike? Yes, I do. I was one of the, one of the knuckleheads. Out of the gang members, who was first? Vanguards, Blue Notes? 
Oh, the bank cards was before any of the Because the bank cards was combined of both Bloods and Crips. Yeah. Okay. The bank cards... That seemed like the better idea. Well, the bank cards was originally supposed to be started because of the way things were going down with the BGF and other blacks that wasn't BGF. That's why the vanguard started. That's good. Was, was, was the vanguard strictly a, a, a Southern California? No. Nah. They, they had people from up north. But you didn't have that many there from in Tracy. Tracy was... If you, you spent a week there, and if you wasn't about it, you probably wouldn't even, you know, you had to tell them to move you somewhere. Vanguard is disbanded now, right? Yeah. yeah. What, 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 what was the mission of them when they started? What, what was their purpose? To better crypt themselves against stuff that was going on with different other groups. Different racial groups or our own? Our own and different. Why, why not beach yet? Why 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 spoon her off into all these different groups? Well, for me personally, I had a cousin that was a BGF and I had older homeboys that was BGF that when when I stepped in Tracy told me no. You will not be joining us. Period. That's that was what, a good heads up. Yeah, no, nah, well I mean, you know, for whatever their reasons was at the time. They wouldn't allow me to be, and they wouldn't allow nobody to approach me to try to get me to join. So, so you said to about, so you work with the Malcolm X uh, grad, you know, organization as a teenager. So, you know, as, you know, the organization kind of disbanded, so to speak. Then, where did your life take? What direction did you go in? Well, I started creating my, my own cadre in the organization, and uh, I gave the Code name uh, the biggest organization, the Little Devil. So I named the Little Devil after uh, the Chinese uh, revolutionaries. Mm. And the Little Devils consisted of individuals you know, from the age of 12 years old to 20. Both mm. okay. male and female. The Little Devils, when I disbanded them, all the males except for one became Compton Crip under the title Randy Crip. Uh, the, the single one, Sammy Dotson, became the leader of Brook Town High Road. Uh, no other Crip set in Los Angeles could. He had the caliber of Randy Crip. Randy Crip was trained in urban real warfare. And so, Chris throughout Los Angeles and California period respected Randy Chris out of Compton. And for me, I on the West Side, all the hogs that I was associated with that was pushing any kind of line when we went, half of them was from Compton, pretty much. You know, and I can go from name to name to name. Of course, I was disappointed that they became gang members. But at the time, they assured me that they're not going after innocent people. Their, their enemy was a power combatant. Not to say that that was acceptable by me, because the first thing I did in 1972, I called for a, a, a peace treaty among the Crips and the power uh, everything was going on fine until the police gang task force committed drive-by on the high road while claiming to be Crips. And they did drive-by from the Crips while claiming to be high road. Mm. And so that brought an end to that peace street. Okay. I disbanded the little devil in early 1972 and went underground. When I when I resurfaced back in early nineteen seventy four, I happened to be driving in South Central Los Angeles and it was a uh, it was an evening time. It was a sister out in the street trying to wave down traffic for somebody to stop. I made a U turn and there was a problem she said a friend of hers was getting raped. So I had a flashlight in the helicopter, I ran towards the back, pretending 
then I was talking to a gang of people, and I can hear individuals, individuals raping the young 14 year old girl. I can hear them hit the fence, jumping over the fence. Uh, I was able to pick up the little 14 year old, put it in the car. Uh, I dropped him off, and uh, the following year, I was on the run. I needed a safe house, and I thought about the female, Linda Kelly, who was who had weighed me down in traffic. And so I went by her spot to see if she had a, a plan that I could hide out over her house for a few days. And uh, the game that I had uh, kicked away, they had remembered me. And as I'm talking to Linda, and leaving because she said, hey, you need to leave the crystal coming. And they were Avalon Chris, and he's the one that was raping the little 14-year-old. Uh, they set up an ambush before I can get to the car. But I picked up sitting up the ambush. At the time, I had uh, a German looper on me, and a uh, and, uh, 22. And so, just as they came out of the ambush, uh, I went into military mode, shot three of them. The leader of them, Buddy Gainsbury, was killed. As a result of the killing of Buddy Gunster, I never gave a statement. I have never given a statement, never justified in my behalf. And the jury came back and heard the evidence with voluntary manslaughter, which should be the state prison. So you get convicted. Now, so actually, when you get arrested, you well, you go to Los Angeles County Jail, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, what were the dynamics of the county jail back then? Was it sectioned off by race, by gangs? How did the jail function? Everything from the county jail, mostly in the county, way along the county jail, they had it. They didn't tell you how much food to get. And so, uh, for six weeks in the whole county jail, they put the blue cart into the train and the trustees is the one who feeds you. It is no more supervision or nothing. And so for six weeks, every Friday, they give you two donuts. Uh, they didn't give me my two donuts. If you went to get time, you didn't get no donuts. Then they turn around and try to spare you your food item back to you. And so I was just in the mindset I was highly trained. And if I'm dealing with a the least sick black who all was in the con and some of the biggest brothers you can see, uh, bodybuilders and whatnot. But I knew that uh, the number one trustee, I was going to waste them. And so what I did, uh, I put together two zip guns and uh, I went to their cell early in the morning. As a child, everybody goes to sleep. It's supposed to be open. I was the only one up. I go into the field with a hand signed coffee pot. And uh, I slammed it into his face a couple times while he was snoring. Busted out all his teeth, nose broken. He was screaming and selling his other truck. He was in the house. And uh, I was at the back of the chair. They came to get me. I pulled out the dip gun. It didn't register them. And I had a dip gun. And uh, I fired on one shot, they broke the cover, and a brother named Iron Man, well known in San Quentin Postal, told me to come into a history on an eye before the sheriff get there. So, for facts, I shot off the second gun. And uh, the individual wound up killing on me. The next guy told on me, and uh, they took me to the home with the gold sucker. I did 10 days. And uh, when I got out of the hole, uh, that was the best education I got because that single incident traveled all over LA County Jail and some of the individuals that I could never walk in their shadow, they now embraced me. I went to prison in 1974. But I went to, I started off at the Garden Center in Tino. Mm -hmm. And uh, I first day on the yard. Uh, a cripple coach me. He actually had one eye. And he did, uh, if I kick him down, $70 with the canteen, he'll fix the 
I have people, family that's BGF, and I have good partners that's BGFs and all that. But at Tracy, during that time when I was there, it, it got kind of out of hand.
And that was Folsom? That, that was Trace State Penitentiary. When they slid, when you, when, uh, you go to Tracy, I got, I got kicked out of YTS for stabbing the council, six foot nine counselor. Went to the Chino C County Jail, um, end up getting to the police, stabbing police, whatever there, and end up going to Chino. My first experience at Chino, coming out my cell, as a 16 year old, coming out my cell in Chino as a 16 year old. I opened my cell, I opened my cell door, I walked out, all I heard was charge. Whites and Mexicans charging at the blacks. I turned around, the blacks running that way. Well, I ran in the middle of the whites and Mexicans. I didn't care. I'm not running for nobody. That was my first experience of racial violence. And I still didn't understand it because I didn't understand why older blacks older than me ran. Why well, I ran into it. End up going to Tracy. They sent me to Tracy State Penitentiary. What year? In 79, December 79. I mean, December 77. Uh, they sent me to Tracy State Penitentiary in 70, December 77, 78, something like that. So, Pumpkin came in my cell. And when I saw all these Mexicans and whites going for us, and we start going in. Right, let's go. We go, let's go in the yard. This is my first experience when I knew the guards wasn't shit. As we walked in the unit, I heard the guard pull the rail in J-Wing and say, charge. When he said charge, every door opened up. Mexicans and whites came out of every cell and came from behind us and started attacking and throwing brothers over the chair. Just start throwing them over the chair, stabbing them. We started getting down. A white dude had a zip gun in front of me, and I didn't know what it was. He trying to shoot me, but it wouldn't light. And someone said, Rocky, watch out, it's a gun, it's a gun. And pushed me, and the gun went off, and I lost it. I picked that motherfucker up and started smashing his head against a goddamn prison cell until I saw blood come out. And as I'm trying to fight to get other motherfuckers, the more brothers getting hurt, an older dude from Hoover, who was BGF, he grabbed me by my collar and said, we can't win, homie, we can't win. And they pulled me out, and I'm fighting all these older dudes Black dudes trying to pull me out the unit because we were losing. And I'm like, nigga, I'd rather lay down and die in there, nigga, than be in the hallway with you niggas. So I'm sitting in the hallway crying because I was frustrated. They took me out a battlefield. And they took me out the battlefield. I'm crying. I'm seeing the police start finally came in and they escorting people, brothers off the gurney. 20, 30 brothers on the gurney. The question, Rocky, was the older guy from Hoover Clan Hoover? It was Clarence. Clarence Hoover. Okay. It was Clarence Hoover. Clarify. It was Clarence Hoover. What's, what's significant about Clarence Hoover? He won the biggest Hoover, Hoover names in the history of Hoover Crip. One of them out of many. And uh, I done said a lot of niggas, and not saying that I say them, but I done showed them the, the, the route, you know? And, I, and you know, it, it makes me angry when I see people that done, done been there and done that. Just like my homie Rock or Rocky and stuff, you know? He was about the hardest uh, uh, a youngster that I ever tried to tell something to. You know, I could I could name a few more just like him. But yeah, uh, when I, I had an opportunity for them to be in Tracy, you know, as, half of them was juveniles, you know, pretty much. And Tracy. Mm -hmm. But I have the chance to, like, keep them, from, you know, from losing their lives and shit because they was with the business. Mama, they was just on some retarded shit. You know what I mean? They was... Uh, anything they was ready to do it at a drop of a pen. Especially when it came came to each other. What kicked off this incident that you're talking? It was about? a racial war. But what, See, but what kicked it off? But like it was that? again. It was a race. There's no such thing. What kicked it off? There's politics in prison. The blacks, the Mexicans, and Mexicans and Aaron Brotherhoods—they fighting brothers. Anything black. 
And that's all I saw. I told you, in, Tra in, in Chino, my first experience with whites and blacks at charge. I go to Tracy, the same shit happened. So mentally, I'm preparing myself now what I got to do. So they put us on lockdown for two weeks. They said we're going to shower um, six blacks, six Mexicans, six whites. The whites and, me and Mexicans on top of the chair. The blacks on the bottom. So I said, word out, I need knives. So we get knives in the shower. I go in the shower, I tell all the blacks, we finna handle our business. I'm 16. We finna handle our business. They looked at me like I was crazy. Now we, we, we ride with you, we ride with you. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. Sadiki from Rolling 20s. Okay. He says, go, Rockhead. We start walking up the stairs like we're going back to our cells. We ran into the shower area with the Mexicans and whites. And I ran up in there, one of the head dudes took off running. So as I stabbed one dude in there, I chased him down a goddamn tear and jumped on top of him, not knowing what I'm doing. This is my first real stabbing. I stabbed him 45 times, but most of them were just barely punctured. Two of them went in his ass. Police had to come and shoot me with a bean bag to get off of him. I didn't stop then. They came out with a 38 and I stopped. What kind of knife did you have? I had a little pen knife, a little pen, little. I don't know what kind of knife they gave me, a little pen knife though at that time. So after that happened, they sent me, they sent me the unit. Send me the K-Wing, the hole. Tracy Hole. I'm in Tracy Hole. I get a letter from Ajax and Baby Rock from Hoover Crips. They had life in prison back in 77, 76, 77, I think. They said, look at little homie. We heard about you. You're a good little dude, but we vanguards. I said, I sent them back. They, what you mean, vanguards? At that time, like I said, it wasn't but 100 Crips in prison, state prison at that time. This, from my understanding, this from my understanding, the BGF started a front-line car called the Vanguards, which consists of Crips and Bloods. Crips and Bloods, Crips and Pyrus. They was the front-liners. But they eventually didn't like the BGFs at, at the end. But they were front-liners. So Ajax them sent word to me, hey, look at me. We can't, we can't fuck with you. We know you're at war with the whites and Mexicans. You know, we can't do anything. We're on the oath. But if you need you, if you need us, we'll help you. I said, no, nah, y'all up on the paperwork, homie. I got this. So I go to the yard. It's me, probably another homeboy. It was the rest of BGFs on the yard. Tracy Yard was built unique. You had one side, half of the yard was a, was a handball court. The other half was a basketball court, the toilet, and the shower. <clears throat> so a lot of times we say yard switch. We switch over, get on the handball court, get on the basketball. Our backs against the wall, walking this way. They back against the gate, walking this way. And a lot of times we say charge, and we start warning against each other, stabbing each other. That was the gladiator school way. You never knew when we was gonna get off. I walked out the cell. They said, "Welcome to the job." I said, I "Ain't no motherfucking job. My fuck y'all. I'm from Compton Crip." All right. And while we're on the subject of the BGF, what I want to ask you about some. Some, I'm gonna name some names. Like, what about Qatari Golden? What role did he play? Who is he? Well, Qatari, Qatari uh, started off as a, a foot soldier. He was well respected. He caught a killing uh, a month after the killing of George Jackson, and he caught a killing in September.
back in 1976, where you had an organization of Hispanics and Mexicans and whites that tried to keep uh, the violence and uh, keep an understanding with the establishment of the prison system. And these are pictures that were taken back there in 1976. Well, and I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, back in the day, man, they just let us bring drugs in, man, because they kept peace on the yard. Mm -hmm. They kept peace on the yard. If it was drugs on the yard, everybody happy. Ain't no drugs, everybody mad, want to kill each other. <clears throat> but then that's when some more problems came in. That's when more problems came in because, because now you own. They giving you credit and you got 10 days to pay and you don't pay, it's gonna get cracking, man. <laughs> Any little thing 
so let me ask you this, going back a little bit. So I say, you know, you said the BTF had kind of went two different ways, the old guard and the new guard, and they went to war. Now, after Qatari won the war, did the guard, did the two different guards come back together, or they stayed separate? So, uh, Qatari, let me, let me show you how the war came to an end. The war came to an end in Tracy. Uh, Qatari had put a, the dragon on me, it's a death sentence. He put the dragon on me, a death sentence, because he believed that I was, I was keeping the whole board structure organized in, in, in his place, and he was trying to renew that. So whoever controlled Tracy controlled the BGM. So Qatari wanted to put a couple of his soldiers in command over Tracy that wanted me to kill Blacks, they were going up to the intimidation where they hear to these two individuals uh, leadership. I said word back to Katori. They, they had to earn that. They had to earn that respect. I'm not going to have the individuals what they feel to these two individuals. So, for that right there, Katori put the death on me. It came two years after me. Uh, both of them was hit. Uh, Finally, the Tory found somebody who was pretty close to me, Bunchy Carter's younger brother. Bunchy was my friend. Talked to me right in that room there. And we shared Panther Piss together. We drank wine together. Uh, I don't remember him smoking no weed with me, but I know we drank wine. Um, and he talked with me. He didn't school me, he talked to me. Because he made a statement once uh, Big Mon, Big Craig, you ain't but 17, you can rob a bank now and won't. Do nothing to go to YTS. But see, but that was wrong. Because at that time, they started sending us to prison at 17. See, his brother ended up going to prison still there. It's from 16. He had, you know, it's still a little message to me. You know, I'm speaking to you. It's not accepted to this message. You terminate the message. The brother, a bunch of called brother, told him there will be to serve. He told him, I'm going to lay out the truth in your feet. And I believe that once I lay out the truth, your feet will have the blacks and traces to subordinate himself to put your in the guard. And that's what happened. And so in May 1978, after uh, Bunchy Carter, younger brother, ran the message from Kotari, ran the time speech of and in the key word for told me that he's under the Constitution and the opposed to the fellow of Hermann. I told him, that's all I need to hear, Gil Katori, that I said, Tracy belongs to him. At that moment, the whole board of Central uh, Committee of General began to ask for political purge because they knew by losing Tracy, they lost the war. From the 70s, to the 80s, all the 70s and all the 80s, the most volatile times in prisons ever. It, it, it all had to do, in, especially in San Quentin, it's, everything is cut along racial lines. And uh, the, the big king of, the, of San Quentin back then, quote unquote, Mexican mafia. Okay, they dictated everything. Who can sell dope? Where it come from? Who you can buy your dope from? You know, uh, Gambling activities in the prison, they, you know, everything, anything illegal, they wanted to control. Okay, blacks and Tracy would produce that on the couch. Tracy was considered the gladiator in the school in California prison. Okay, in Folsom and in St. Queen, it was a different story. In general population, in St. Queen, Mexican killed so many. Black in also general population. The whites killed so many blacks, and there was no retaliation. There was no uh, 
was shipped out. They never let me back on the line because of my affiliation. Uh, and uh, they sent me to Folsom. Uh, I was one of the youngest ones that went to Folsom and went on the line at that particular time in the first part of 1975. Because usually you had to be over 30 to go on the line. But I had did so much time in so many federal pens. And I had a, a jacket of being affiliated uh, that they decided to go on and send me to Folsom. Um, I was never on the level four. Um, when I first came back to prison, for this case right here, I was immediately placed in uh, solitary confinement in Chino. And I went to um, New Folsom. I was on the main line of New Folsom for about three, maybe four weeks. And they rounded up myself and a number of other um, Africans off the main line. I was placed in solitary confinement. And I didn't get back out of solitary confinement until I arrived here in November of 2015. Man, that's crazy, man. And I think it was really important, I think it's really important to say that for Africans in particular in prison, we really did have our back up against the wall. Like, we didn't just have to contend with the kind of institutionalized racism that was really prevalent um, amongst some staff members, but we also had to deal with the kind of racism um, from the white supremacist groups, um, we had to deal with people that was aligned with them. We even had to deal with brothers um, who didn't see our struggle as being their struggle. And by virtue of that right there, they wouldn't support They wouldn't support it. It was really just a handful of brothers in some prisons like San Quentin um, that um, assumed responsibility for representing the interests of the entire African population in that prison up there. So um, we really, really did have our backs up against the wall. Hugo Yogi Pinnell, what, what was his role in all in this, in this the history of the BGF? Well, he, no, he had no history with the BGF. They transferred Hugo Pinnell out of Quentin to Folsom. After the death of the Tories, Hugo Pinnell felt that it was an opportunity for him to continue control over California prison politics. I was in Tracy at the time, I was here to communicate with Hugo Pinnell, and uh, he ran all this, all this, and that was made in this thing, and uh, come join, he just, uh, one day she can't fall. Uh, I had, uh, by then, I was known to have a, a structure in Virginia. I knew how to put together a structure. And so he tried to improve it, and I feel him worried about that. I appreciate going for the note thing. Now, 75, 76, the demographics of San Quentin start to change. Now you got a lot of Crips coming. They still got the seven of lives. When I got to prison in 77. 77. And, and what was that sentence? You know, that a life sentence without a seven of life sentence. Because you know, people that was on seven of lives, and most of them still spent their whole lives up in there. You know? So, I mean, most of everybody I know that has some of lies and stuff, man, you know, some of them still up in there right now today after 50 years. But just like what Greg Davis told us, you know, you know, all them, you know, life is life. I mean, you know, shit, it don't matter. You got 10 in life, whatever life is. You got a life sentence, you don't do life. I mean, yeah, we went to the parole board. But it was just some mock. Parents, you know, yeah. all that there, you know. But shoot, I mean, you weren't finna get no date. I mean, you had model prisoners up in there. They ain't had them 115 over 20 years. And that time in there and all that there, it wasn't getting a date. So you know that you wasn't getting them. So I just stopped attending. I was in the shoot most of the time. And over 15 years or something like that in the shoot. First time was like probably seven years straight in the shoot. And then, you know, off and on in other years and years here and there, you know. So, how long did that take for you to actually come back out here? Uh, 42 years of my life. But now, 1978 to 79, when they start giving them 25 years of life and them 30 years of life, that's when you start getting all your hardcore Crips coming in and the Mexican Mafia couldn't control them. Couldn't go to them and say, well, you got to buy your dough from us. Well, look at your partner, we ain't got to buy nothing from you. No, we are our own entity. We get it from our people. You know, we got we got a we got a hookup. But the Mexican mafia didn't want to go for us, so they start they put a red light on all Crips. No, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you something. I was at a Crip meet in YTS. No, hold up, hold up, cuz I was at a Crip meet in YTS. 
That's what it is. Now, I'm going to tell y'all some good shit. I was at a crib meeting in YTS. Who would Joe? Who would Joe? Nigga, Joe Stanley. Nigga, we was in this crib meeting. And Mac Thomas was there. The leader of the Compton Crips was taken into custody today for a shooting in southwest Los Angeles. It's what we're now learning from authorities. 16-year-old Roy Crutchfield was killed today after a brief altercation with Crips gang members. So Mac Thomas is the mate. Nigga, this is on YTS yard. It was a bunch of Crips there, nigga. Who would Joe stepped in? Who would Joe didn't like no Pomona's? He didn't like no West. He didn't like no San Diego niggas. Who would Joe stepped in the middle of that meeting and say, nigga, if you ain't no Crip before 1976, nigga, you ain't no Crip. Ain't no more Crips, nigga. When I get to YTS, I call my case in San Diego. While I was in San Diego, Juvenile Hall Central, I met some niggas from San Diego Crips. Bull and a few other other people, right? So I knew they had San Diego Crips down there at that time, right? And that was like in 1986, I mean 76, 77. That's the man's calling the motherfucking Bicentennial. But, 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 he got shot down yeah. by a high power, bro. That nigga oh. Mac Thomas told that nigga step back. Mac Thomas stepped in that meeting and said, Cook, understand what you're saying, Cook. Crips don't die. They multiply home, boy. And we don't judge Crips by when they started Crip. We judge Crips by how blue they party. Mm, that's Mac Thomas. Mac Thomas said, we don't judge Crips by when they start Crip. We judge Crips, cuz, by how blue they party is, cuz. So, step back, cuz. Crips don't die, homie. They multiply. That's that's the shit I learned, the wisdom I learned from niggas that had this cripping in their heart. And Mac Thomas believed me. Mac Thomas was a higher power. As high as powers who would Joe was. Mac Thomas supersede him by leaps and bounds at this YTS yard home. So it ain't it ain't when you started cripping. <laughs> it's how blew your audience yeah. and what you can do to take Crip from where they is now to where they should be, nigga. So, nigga, if you 50 years old and you know something about Shibu and Nu that's going to get us money and you want to be that with us and you true to it and you can stand the side of blood <laughs> Even at an old age, <laughs> then, nigga, you might be able to be a crip, nigga. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is what we do. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. On the TS Big Screen with Max and Killers. On fives and black gorilla. Gorilla. It's nothing frigid. Can't get caught slipping, laying under the tent. Got to be a swabbish. Can't be no jerk. Boy, I do. Dirt, and I'm a cold piece oh, of work. Yeah.